Hello and welcome to another video update from Mission Projects International. My name is Nathan Clark and with me today are Cody Francis and Steve Rawlings. Steve's a new member of the Mission Projects International team. He's our mm -hmm. office manager and um, has also been helping out with another mission trip. And Cody and Steve just returned from the Democratic Republic of Congo. We've traveled there a couple of times before looking at the exciting work that the Lord is doing there. Mm -hmm. but. Um, just coming for the first time from Congo. Steve, what was your what was your first impression of Congo? Well, it was different from all of... I've been in several countries and this one seemed the least developed from the other countries that I've visited. And um, so I was a little different in that um, well, some of the areas didn't have power and transportation was very difficult. There was not too many times that you could even find a taxi to get to one place to another. And so it was kind of an a, um, adventure to be able to survive through the day and um, <laughs> get from one village to the next. And so it was, it was a really neat experience and I really enjoyed the people. I think I would probably like to go back there and um, found it to be better than some of the other countries I've been in, actually. How would you describe it for somebody who hasn't been there before? What's, what's it look like if you go out into the countryside? We only were in two bigger cities. One was the capital city, Kinshasa, and it was very large. I don't know how many millions live there, but yeah. it's very dirty and um, crowded. And uh -huh. So yeah. once we flew out of that and got into the interior of the country more, the landscape was very green. Um, there's a lot of tall grass and they call it bush, but it's more like rolling hills of yeah. tall grass. And um, a lot of times the villages are set up on the on the top of a hill, and then down below will be a river, and that's their water source. And so down by the water, there's lots of trees and wildlife, and it, you have the feel of a jungle. And it was really different. I haven't really been in a jungle setting like that. And the water is... Um, you can't see into it, so you're not sure what you might find if you were to step into it. So we did an adventure into the water, but um, it was it was really a neat time. Uh -huh. What's it What's it like to to eat there, and what you know? What are sleeping arrangements like? And well, they once we got to the villages, it's. Uh, I guess the Bible worker had arranged to have a house built for us. Each time we arrived, there was a a hut built, and it was. They usually amounted to, a, I don't know, it was 30 feet by 12 feet and divided into three parts. So we would, um, the Kasongo and his wife would sleep on one side and we'd sleep on the other side. And then in the center, we'd had a table to eat at. And um, Kasongo's wife and his daughter-in-law came along to cook us food. And they had bought for us, their local food is cassava root. They yeah. ground it up and add water and it turns into kind of a Play-Doh, yeah. <laughs> sticky consistency foo -foo. that they call foo-foo. And I said foo-foo too. And I, I didn't even want to taste it. It, was, I didn't, it didn't appeal to me. So we... Um, me either, by the way. Yeah. We... So the Kasango in the big city was able to buy beans and rice. And so for the 14 or 15 days, we were there, 14 days, maybe 13 days, we had beans and rice two or three times a day. And that was fine for the first six or seven days. And then that was even a challenge. <laughs> but there were a lot of fruit. As we walked through the village, we saw avocado trees and pineapples and mangoes and bananas. And so there was some of these were available. We had pineapples and bananas and avocados available. We appreciate those more. So we they were really that. good. Yeah, <laughs> we, the avocado and the beans and the rice was very good. So good. Good. The, um, the beds, they, they had a, like a four inch slab of foam that they put on a... Um, that was special for us. Normally they wouldn't have that. Oh, okay. Well, we had a nice bed. It was really <laughs> good. Um, their bed, without the foam, is they, they, they stick four poles into the ground that have a fork on the end yeah. of it. Yeah. And then they run a pole across that. And then they run some more slats across that. And they lay a, um, a, like a yeah, bamboo shade across it. And um, that's what they sleep on. Yeah. And, it would have been a little hard for me, probably, but 
I guess it's okay for them. But the beds were long enough. I found that a lot of, we were the taller people in this area, and so the beds were long enough for us, and it was comfortable. Um, it helped having our mosquito nets. Yeah, that, and we did have a mosquito net, which um, we could hear the mosquitoes, but the security of inside that net made it easy to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's definitely, it's definitely a different experience to go there. And Cody, what, what was the purpose of this trip? What were, what were the main goals? Well, we wanted to go there and see how the work had been progressing. As we had been there a couple other times and we'd seen it grow from basically one church in one village to several churches in the area to many churches in many different areas, we wanted to go there and try to encourage them, evaluate what was taking place, and to see how we might be able to help them as we were there and what we could do after we came back. And any trip to Congo begins with a, a flight into Kinshasa, international sure. flight, and then a flight from Kinshasa out into the province we're there, which is Bandundu province. But from there, what was your trip like? Where did you start and where did you go this time? Well, we started, we arrived into Kikwit, which is where we would fly the first to, uh, after from Kinshasa to Kikwit. And we arrived there Friday morning, midday, something like that. And so we rented a vehicle to take us out to Masongo, which is kind of where the work is centered. And we that's where we went last time. That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. We actually stayed in the school administration building and the church offices. Mm. So it was a building that they had built specifically for that. And so that was where we slept the first night or two. And uh, so we started there, saw the brethren there. We spent the Sabbath there with them, of course. And uh, just a blessing seeing them again, seeing people that we hadn't seen for many years, but that were still holding, holding fast to the truth that they had learned. Mm. Wonderful. Well, the last time we were there, we walked to a number of different villages, and before this trip, Kasongo sent us a map that showed us where we'd gone last time, and then showed us a greatly expanded area where the work has continued to go on now. And I know you had continued, wanted to go out and visit some of these new areas. Can you tell us, tell us about that? Tell us about the churches there, the work there? Sure. The the further areas, there was one area in particular I wanted to go to. There are several. There's like three or four areas that are separated by 50 to 100 miles from the Songo, and so it's difficult to make it to all of those, obviously, but we wanted to get a sampling and visit at least one or two of those areas. And so the first day we actually walked out to a village that was relatively close, and it was a new village. There was just a school, there had, was no secondary school there, and so the, they had uh, established the secondary school there and were in the process of establishing a church there. And so we walked out there, and it was, it was neat to be out there and to receive the reception from the village and uh, uh, then just see what the needs were and how excited people were that, that there was now a school and that they wanted a church there too. Mm. So this time, how much walking did you end up doing between villages? I know last time we did lots of walking. Did you do quite a bit of walking this time? Cody did probably twice as much as I did, but I think I walked, we figured I walked around 45 miles, yeah. which was a lot for me. It was really a good um, exercise program that we were on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it helps you to appreciate all of these Bible workers that are working there, the places that they're going. It takes so much effort. And they have, out. it's amazing how much strength they have. They carry, not only do they walk, 20, 30 miles sometimes to get to a village, but they carry 15 to 30 pounds of weight on their head as they're walking. And down steep hills or up steep hills, it doesn't matter, they, they can just keep going. And it was amazing to me. I, I agree. <laughs> it's a, they're, they're working, working hard and it takes sacrifice to be able to, to push and continue to push this work out. And they don't just take a little stroll. I mean, it's not a Sabbath afternoon walk or something like that. I mean, one area that we actually ended up driving to, the, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get a vehicle at first. And so they said, well, it is possible to walk there. You have to get up at about 3 in the morning, and maybe you'll get there by 11 or midnight the next day, or that yeah, same day. Yeah. So you would be walking, I mean, whatever that is, I mean, 18 hours or something like yeah. that. And, 30, 40 miles. Yeah, I mean, there, it's probably even more, 40 or 50 yeah. at the rate that they're walking. So, I mean, they just... That's the only way to get to some of these areas. And they have a burden for these souls, so they're willing to walk those distances to try to bring the message there. Hmm. What, what was your impression? Tell us about some of the villages that you visited and what, what churches are there, the schools that are there, the state of the churches, things like that. 
The second area we went to, which was actually we drove there because it was the distance of about 50 to 100 miles from where Masango was. And uh, so as we ended up, it took us like seven or eight hours driving there, going it through their roads, which it, they weren't too bad, but uh, you always get stuck a couple times and things like that. But one thing that was really neat about this village, they had been preparing for us. They had built a very large house there for us actually by their standards. And uh, they, we had, were supposed to have been there a couple days before, but because we were unable to arrange transportation, we didn't make it until a couple days late. So they were all worried that we were broke down somewhere or something had happened. And so as we drove into the village, the village just basically erupted. People started running behind our Jeep, and we rode, went into the main part, and they were honking and singing, and then we went to the, uh, where the mission compound was, and virtually a large percentage of the village came and we prayed together there thanking the Lord for a, the safety and that we had brought us there. Mm -hmm. That village is actually a fair, relatively large village. Uh, you were there more than I was. The, um, the, what would you say, about a thousand or more I, people that lived yeah, there? Yeah, I would say a thousand. We figured there was around 600 plus that just came to the meeting. And yeah. So there was quite a few people there. Yeah. It was, and you said they didn't have a school there, except the school that had just been established by our workers yes. there. Yeah. So it's amazing to think of that a village, a large village of about a thousand that yeah. didn't have a school or, or anything like mm. that. Yeah. So from there, what additional travels did you, did you do out from around that village? Well, from there, a couple, several of the Bible workers and Brother Kasanga and I went, and we were going to another village that was 20 plus miles away probably. And we had to have a meeting there in the morning. Morning is the best time to have a meeting before everybody goes to the uh, jungle or the fields to work or things like that. So we had a meeting, and that was where there were about the 600 people or whatever that were there. And then we had to immediately leave, and we walked, I don't know, three or four miles down to the river. And it was a relatively large river for the area. And uh, so how were we going to get across? Well, there was a dugout canoe. And so our team loaded up into this dugout canoe. Brother Kasongo, it was the first time he'd ever been in a canoe before, and so he was praying, I think, the whole way over. <laughs> of course, there were hippopotamuses and crocodiles that we did not see, but uh, they do are right there in the area, so you can understand some, uh, yeah, some reason for concern. <laughs> but uh, so we went over there, and then on the other side, actually, was a palm oil factory that we actually toured through, just walked through, and um, that was why there was... Uh, Anyway, it was a convergence of two roads on either side and the canoe that went in between the two roads. And there was actually even a ferry boat that took some of the big trucks across, but it had been there a little bit longer than uh, I would want to trust my life on it. So uh, I was glad we went in the canoe and not, not, that, uh, not that sinking boat. And so then we walked the rest of the way to the village and we, I was, it was very hot that day and, we were, and I was so tired, but fortunately, a rainstorm came and so we had to stop in a village and it cooled it down and that brought us walking through the jungle in the dark and uh, down some very slippery mud slopes crossing a river and back up to the village and so finally we made it to the village and we were very thankful to make it there as you can imagine and we get there and of course we didn't know where we were going but some of the brethren that had been there went and knocked on one of the houses and he opened the door and got this astonished look because we had sent a messenger there before but the messenger hadn't arrived. And so we, he brought us in to his house, and within half an hour the chief was there and greeting us. So even though they had not even known that we were coming, the next morning as I was walking around the village, I heard the chief, and he was walking around the village calling to everybody, we're going to be having a meeting. Of course, it was in his language, so I didn't understand, sure. but I knew what, was, what, what the was situation that. was. He was calling to everybody to come to this meeting. So we had a meeting, and... Once again, two-thirds of the village probably, we met out under a tree, and really a neat meeting. We had developed a technique in which we would, uh, I would, we would sing, and the people would gather, and then I would present a message based on the Bible, either I would present the, like, Elijah's return, how God is calling us to be Elijah's, or the judgment, or the second coming, or something like that, trying to make it somewhat of a, appealing but also working in that we need to be obedient to the law and that the Sabbath is a part of God's law too. And I wouldn't deal extensively with it, but I would mention it. And like, so this morning we talked about the judgment, how if we were lying or stealing, we're going to have to answer before the judgment. And you could tell that the Holy Spirit was there to bring conviction on the hearts. And some of the people said, 
We've never heard this before. We're fearing for the judgment now. We need to be ready for the judgment. And uh, so then afterward, we would open it up for questions. And uh, so the questions would usually come, well, what about the Sabbath? What about and all of these different things? And the Bible workers, that was their turn to speak. And uh, so they would go through and they would answer the, these questions and they had their way. They would compare the Kikongo Bible and the French Bible. And by comparing these two, it would show that the, that, uh, the Sabbath is on Saturday. And so we had actually one man there, a couple, that were trying to object. Uh -huh. And they presented, well, I thought it was just you have eternal life if you know Jesus. And you read John 13, 17, 3. And they said, well, that's exactly true. We have eternal life by knowing Jesus. But first John says that this is how we know that we know him, if we're keeping his commandments. Mm -hmm. So that man did not want to venture to have any objections again after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and it was, we needed to go back so that we could walk through the village again, uh, walk all the way to the other village again. And uh, the people set, kept telling us, no, you can't go yet. We have more questions. Please help mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So just tremendous to see the thirst for truth that's there. And there, there's been this tremendous thirst and tremendous growth and there's churches in many, many villages. Describe some of the different types of churches, the physical buildings that you saw. Okay. Well, there are, there are a few churches, I think about four cement structures in Masongo and uh, Koshi and a couple other places that have been built. And then a lot of them have the more the church that looks like their house, which is mud on the sides and sticks for the support or trees for the support and then grass thatching. And then there's others that are, have not developed that far yet that are just have the palm leaves that are covering everything. And that provides protection from the sun, but that's all, not protection yeah. from the rain. Yeah, absolutely. But many places where we met, the whole village would be there, so we couldn't meet in any facility because they were too large. So we just have to meet out meet in the outside. trees. Sure, yeah. sure. And as they have been, these churches are being, uh, being built, they have built a number of churches and a number of schools since we were there last time. How have they been paying for those and, and getting that done? Well, we've sent through the donations that people have sent in, we've been able to send some, and so the, some of the permanent uh, cement structures were built by br our brethren's donations here, yes. and, and they're so thankful for that. Yes. And, but one thing I was very excited to see was that a number of the schools, or some of the schools, they have their own self-supporting business project. Yes, that's so that exciting. The Bible workers have taken, took one month of their salary, and they all donated it, and thus they had a pool to work with. And so they started buying cassava and whatever was selling well in Kinshasa, shipping it into Kinshasa, and then the profit, they would buy building materials. And they've built uh, at least a, one or two schools that way, and then also um, put sheets on some of the other stools, the metal sheets, and the capital that they were originally working with, they just keep it working. Mm -hmm. So they have, through their own industry, have been able to build schools and help with churches and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was really nice to see. Mm -hmm. It's very encouraging just to hear about the growth and see how things mm -hmm. are going there. In our next section, we'll actually talk to and interview some of the workers that are working there and introduce them to you. So we'll be back in a moment. In our last two trips to Congo, the thing that has impressed me the most probably is the tremendous need for workers yes. there in Congo. As you go out and you see in the province that they're working, so many people interested in the truth. And this, this need for people to go out and share with others. Yes. Has this area been worked by Seventh-day Adventists in the past? Well, not really. That's what is amazing. People there have never heard about Seventh-day Adventists before. They've never heard about the Three Angels message. Mm. They've never heard about the Sabbath or anything like that. And it's this way for hundreds of miles in that vicinity. And I really believe that the Lord has raised up Brother Kasongo as this former Baptist pastor who was converted to Seventh-day Adventism. And the Lord gave him a burden to go out and to work this area mm -hmm. that has never been worked before. And now, as you mentioned, the thirst is everywhere. And who's, who's helping him now? Well, when he began, it was just he and his family. 
And there were no helpers. In fact, it was spite from a lot of the villages. There yeah. was prejudice from the Baptist leaders that were trying to tell people not to listen to him. But as the work has grown, there have been those that have been converted and then those that have the burden to share the message that he has brought to them. And so presently, there are about 35 Bible workers or something like that in different villages and different areas that are doing a different work. And then there's others that are training to be Bible workers and some that are working as Bible workers but simply are not added as that number because there's no funds to support them. Lay workers. Yes. Working on their own time. And what's it like to be, as you've been there, and I, I've been there too, what's it like to be a Bible worker? Well, it's certainly a challenge. There's certainly other things that they could do. We were asking them, some of them, what did you do before? Others had traded as they had bought and sold things in, in Kinshasa and back and forth. Others had been teachers. And uh, they're, they, as they're a Bible worker, they're responsible for the evangelization of an entire village. Yes. And so generally they have meetings every single day, either in the morning or the evening. The Bible worker leads out in those meetings. The Bible worker is the one that's responsible for helping to build the schools and making sure that the schools are getting built, the building the simple bush churches. And then in addition to that, the Bible workers are traveling to other villages that need help and sharing the message there as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very, a uh, very full schedule for the Bible workers. Mm -hmm. and Kasongo has them go to different villages and, and move around some too. Yes. In fact, every third Sabbath of the month, all of the Bible workers switch from their general localities. And that way, everybody gets, to, the churches get to a different gifts, different talents that are there for that Sabbath. And the other Bible workers then are able to see the challenges and difficulties and, and the strengths of the other Bible workers and the churches in that area. So they all get a feel for it. Then they come back and discuss how they can make the work go for, mm -hmm. further forward. And it's also, uh, I mean, that's in addition, or that's then in addition, that's when a new village calls for them, there's always a team that are required to go to that new village as mm -hmm. well. And we had the opportunity this time, you had the opportunity to interview a number of the Bible workers. Yes. And so this time we're going to take, get to listen to one of those interviews. Yes. Brother Isaiah, you're one of the Bible workers. How did you become a Bible worker? He was a student, he was studying, and then as soon as he finished his secondary school, he got his diploma. Uh, I met him, we, were, we shared, I shared with him God's word, and then he gave up his heart to the message, and then uh, uh, he accepted, he, he got the, the vocation to serve the Lord, and then his first work after studies were, uh, was a uh, uh, the Bible, uh, Bible worker. Okay, very okay. good. So you're a Bible worker in, in Zandu. And what do you do as a Bible worker there? In Adventism, we have many, many books to use, uh, some prophecies books, but we every time use Kikongo Bible study and the Bible itself. And uh, how often do you have meetings in the church? Okay, he says uh, uh, in our Adventist church, uh, we have uh, two days of Bible study at the afternoon, and the others we, st we, we pray the morning. We, we have a morning worshiping, and then on Sabbath we worship. So you, so you have a meeting every day at your church? Uh. Yes. And do the non-Adventists from the village, do they come to the meeting also? There are some who are non-Adventists, but they come every time. Okay. Are there any other schools in your village other than the Adventists? No, no other school. No other school. Okay. Only so the Adventist uh, school. The Adventist school is the only school in yeah, Zandu. Yeah, it's the only. They're alone. Very good. How long are you away from your family? Many, many days, many weeks, many even, weeks? Uh, even months. Even months sometimes. Yes, yes, sometimes. How far do you have to walk to the villages? The distance Kianda. Very, very far, far. Like how many kilometers? By kilometer Yeah. By kilometer He doesn't uh, know exactly uh, how much, how many kilometers does he go on foot? But he maybe it's just approximately uh, more than uh, more than uh, 100 
20 kilometers and even more. Okay. Yeah. In our first trip to Congo, one of the people who kind of stood out in my mind was a man named Jean Albert. And he was a, a convert. While we were there, he was baptized. We had yes. the opportunity to interview him, actually. But since then, we haven't really heard a lot from him and what's happening with him until last year. So tell us a little bit of what's happened in that time period since then. What's he, what's he been doing? When we were there the first time, he had seen the sign along the road and it said, Seventh-day Adventist, what is that? I've never heard of that before. He got off the truck and started studying, was there for a number of weeks. And when we were there, he was baptized very on fire. Yes, yes. And so he stayed there a little bit longer, continuing to study, get grounded. But then he needed to go back to his native area, which is about 100 miles away or something like that. And so he went back and he began to share some, but there were some challenges and difficulties. His mother got sick and he needed, felt like he needed to take care of his mother. And mm -hmm. so he ended up doing a bunch of, still doing a lot of the trading that he had been doing before, buying things and then selling them in Kinshasa. But within the last one or two years, something like that, the burden came upon his heart again that he knew he needed to share this message that he knew. Mm -hmm. And so he began to share. And he began to share in his village. He said, you know what, I'm just, I have to give this message regardless. This is what God has called me to do. Mm -hmm. And so he began to uh, the, share there. He began to give the Bible studies. People began to listen. And a church was started. And then as a church was started, a school was started. And then not just a primary or elementary school, but a secondary school was started. And so now there's a, both a primary and secondary school, a church that has been established in that village. And from that village, now the work has branched out and he's gone and shared it with other villages, a couple of which we were able to go to as well. And so now I think there's something like eight or nine other villages that have churches and many of them schools that are worshiping and that are following the truth that John Albert discovered five years ago and that he has been sharing with them. It's wonderful to see what he's, what he's been able to do through yes. the Lord's blessing. And you had the opportunity to interview him this time as well. So we'll, we'll watch that interview now. We want to visit a little bit with Jean Albert and ask him about his story. Mm -hmm. Now, as you left Koshi and you came back, is this your native village? It's his village, and he saw that this uh, village was needy of uh, God's word. And so the people were happy when they heard about this. What impressed them the most about the Adventist message? Centuries have gone past, past, past. They have never heard of uh, the seventh day. They yes. always thought that the seventh day is uh, Sunday. Yes. As he was, he was explaining to them that the seventh, the real seventh, seventh day is uh, Saturday. They were impressioned, amazed. And then they are coming, uh, coming more and more to, 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 to get more information. How many groups have started that are worshiping every Sabbath and studying these Bible studies? In short, he has uh, eight, more than eight. But these eight are those who are uh, every Sabbath meet, meeting. How many villages are there that would like you to come and have a church that meets every Sabbath there? There are many, and here, there are some directors who, uh, who belong to the other church, the Protestant church, and um, some other uh, representative who are here calling you as you came, us, to go there and to settle our, uh, us here. What has helped your work the most here? Mm -hmm. KBS. The, the Bible studies, the Bible studies in your own language, Kikongo? Yeah, KBS, that we can KBS, Kikongo Bible studies. Oh, yes. yes. Bibles, Bibles. Future of America also yeah, the, used the, the yeah. prophecy seminars. Just the printed Bible studies in your own language and the Bibles and the materials is what helps the most. Yeah. What are some of the the biggest needs? The most important need is to have a, build, a church built and then uh, to have also schools. It's amazing to see what somebody that's truly converted what they can do with the Lord's blessing and the Lord's grace. Amen. You know, it's here he was, a new convert, alive with the message, went back to his area. And look at how many churches have been established there. It's amazing. <laughs> and when we were there, 
it was, I was impressed with the work. We were walking around at one, one time and there was a, the English teacher. Frequently there's one person that speaks some English in the village and that's the English teacher at the school. Wow. And we were walking around and we asked him what type of tree that was. And he said, oh, that's a, uh, a kola nut tree. And uh, I said, oh, really, do you eat that? Oh, no, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. We don't eat kola nuts. And uh, so he had been learning not just of, uh, about the Sabbath and the law, but about the health message and things like that as well. John Albert really has a gift for organization too. Mm. As we had the meeting there, we, we actually were doing something else and we came and the whole village was gathered there and they were all in rows and there had been benches that had been put down. Now benches, I mean a, a board yeah. that's just on the ground. And uh, the, there were people that were stationed at each location, particularly where the children were, that were making sure that the children were being quiet. And uh, uh, just you could tell that he had organized things well. And something he was, he, as we were there the first time, we studied a lot about the Three Angels messages. Mm. And uh, so the name of the school is Three Angels Institute. Mm. And so a very apt name for seeking to give the Three Angels message yeah. in that area. Yeah. So it just really touching to see the work that this brother has done. And much of it he did totally on his own. It, he had already been established these churches before he was able to get in contact with Brother Casongo. Totally volunteer working to just give the message. Amen. And one thing that impresses me so much about Congo is, is that what the Lord can do through a consecrated worker yes. in the right area with His Holy Spirit. Casongo went there, there was nothing. That's right. And started it from scratch. And Sean Albert has really done the same thing That's by right. the Lord's grace. Yes. And so his area has been a new, a new area. There's another area that has started um, off more to the south and to the east. Tell us a little bit about what happened with that area and how that work got started. Well, unfortunately, we were not able to make it there. We did meet a couple of the Bible workers there, but the area of Gungu, which is uh, the opposite direction from if you fly into Kikwit and you go uh, west primarily yes, to go yeah. get to Masongo. Well, if you're going to go to Gungu, you go a little bit east and directly south from Kikwit there. So it's a totally opposite direction than from Masongo or any place like that. Well, Brother Kasongo had been uh, working, getting some papers with the government or something like that, and dealing with the government offices. And something I really admire about Brother Kasongo is no matter where he is, no matter what he's doing, he's trying to witness for That's his right. faith. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've seen it in hospitals. He might be visiting somebody he that's might be there. In the hospital. He might be in it, <laughs> but he is sharing his faith. And so he was sharing his faith there in the government offices. And one of the government administrators, as they learned about what the work that Brother Kasongo was doing and somewhat of the message and the schools and the churches and all of this, he said, please, you need to take this message and this work to my area as well, to my home village. And so totally new area that Brother Kasongo, a long too. ways, that he had never been to before. But here is this appeal from this government uh, leader that he had been witnessing to, please take this message to my area. Mm -hmm. And so when they were able to, when he came back to the province, they took Bibles, they took Bible studies, and they made the journey, and it's quite a journey, mm -hmm. down to Gungu. And as they were there, they began to share and to study with the people. And as in many places, the, the interest was just peaked, and uh, they said, we've never heard these things before. How can this be? But they see it from the Bible. And so they said, we please send us someone to teach us so that we can know this precious message. Well, there was no available Bible workers to go. And so there were several young men and, and others that came back to Masongo and were from there Gungu. from Gungu. Okay. They came back with them for two or three months in a Bible worker formation, Bible worker instruction. Huh. And so they went through the, the message, got instruction and things like that. And now they're the ones that are from that area that have been sent back to Gungu hmm. and have been building up the work. Hmm. And uh, there have been, like in many areas, the work does not just stay in one locality. It's Gungu is a major territorial center. And from this territorial center, it's spreading out. So when we were there, and Bibles and with, the, with the little resources that they had, which yeah. wasn't much, mainly word of mouth, uh -huh. because the, the literature and the Bibles are running low that have been mm -hmm. sent there. Mm -hmm. And so they, through word of mouth and through uh, just sharing with the people there, 
there are more churches that had been raised. There were a couple of the Bible workers that had been trained in Misongo and went back to their area. And uh, as we met them, we were very impressed with them and uh, the, their spirit and things like that. And uh, as they went back, they came back to visit us as we were there, since we weren't going to be able to make it there. And uh, there are more churches, even that nobody in Misongo knew about, that they have raised since they have been back there. Praise the Lord. And these brothers are working totally voluntarily. They are just trying to give the message mm. that they have learned. Mm. And we'd like to hear from one of those brothers now. Yes. Mm. With me today is Brother Shama and Brother Kasongo. And uh, Brother Shama, where are you from? Mukele, a sector Mungindu, a territory of Wolf. From here, it might be almost 400. Uh, 50 kilometers. How did you come here? They got a truck. So you rode on one of the big trucks? Okay. How long did it take you coming that way? From Gungu uh, to Kikwit, they, they made two days. Uh -huh. Traveling by truck. Yes. And then from Kiku to uh, to Mosango, um, half of a day. Okay. okay. How many churches are there in the Gungu area? Kele uh, 14. So there's 14 churches. Are these new churches? Bo Kele Kumi Kele Yantama. He says the ten are uh, those who are existing, and then now. They are uh, just creating others for uh, had been added. Okay, so there's four new ones. When were the ten created? When did they begin? After he heard the word, and then he he, he met many many people who accepted, and then they uh, they gathered. They, they were all agreed to uh, to start the church, and then the ten where churches began. Very good. And how long ago was that? Since they have started the the ten. Ten churches. One year have, uh, on. has already passed, and then three more uh, months. Okay, okay, so a little over a year since the ten churches began. Well, Brother Shama, thank you very much for your work, and may the Lord bless the work in the Gungu area. As you can see, the Lord is really working through these Bible workers, and we would encourage you to pray for these Bible workers as they're sacrificing for the Lord, going from village to village. They need our prayers, and. Also pray that additional Bible workers will enter the field. In our next section, we'll be looking at the needs in Congo. At this point, Mission Projects International has made three trips to Congo, and it's been remarkable to see how the Lord has blessed. Each trip that we've gone, there's been changes and tremendous growth. Yes. The first time we were there, there was one main church in Koshi, and then several branch churches that were just beginning and just yes. starting. And then our second trip, the first trip was five years ago, our second trip was three years ago. By that time, there was 15 to 20 churches mm -hmm. and, and a greatly expanded work. What, how many churches are there now? Well, Sometimes it's hard to count because you're not quite sure uh, how many there are that are growing. They seem to be growing so fast. Yeah. But there's about 35 to 50 churches, something like that, depending on how you count it. But there's, and it's not just before, it was just in one localized area, basically. Right, right. Now it has grown to uh, many different territories and even hundreds of miles away. And so it's, it's just been amazing how it's expanded. And there's about that many schools as well. There's something like another 50 schools in various areas also. So it's been an amazing expansion of the work. Mm. And you know, as I think about that, and as I see the work as it's going forward there, it reminds me of some texts in the Bible that talk about 
how the Lord is blessing there. One of these is in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. And it says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. And I really believe that the Lord has opened a door for the work there in the Bandundu province of, of Congo, and that the work is going forward greatly, and the Lord wants it to go even further. Amen. And what are, what are the main um, things that are helping to move the work forward there? Yes. Well, the main part of it is the Bible studies, and the Bibles, and the Bible workers. Mm. There have been, uh, to date, I think something like 15 to 20,000 Bible studies that have been printed mm. in their language, and uh, these Bible studies in their language then are distributed, and the people are amazed as, as they read it. And as they compare it with the Bible, with the Bibles that have been purchased for them, and uh, then the Bible workers go and teach, it's, uh, it's just a combination that a church is gu almost guaranteed to be established mm -hmm. in that village once they see the Bible truth. In some of these villages, there's no churches at all. It's not like there's just, there's lots of churches there. There's no churches, there's no schools, there's nothing there. Yeah. And uh, so some villages, I believe last time when we were there, there wasn't a Bible in the entire yeah. village. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. so we've been able to get some Bibles for them, although when all the Bible workers, when you ask them what the needs are, one of the first things that they always say is Bibles and Bible studies. Yes, yes. And the, the work there, the Bibles and the Bible studies, as the Lord has given those out to people, there's, they've also started doing schools and starting establishing schools. Tell us about the schools there. Yes, the schools are growing forth rapidly too. One of my favorite schools to see was actually in Kikama, where we had been five years ago. And you remember when we went there, there was nothing there. There was no school there or right. anything. And there was no lack of children. It was not because there were no children that there was no yeah. school. It was just they had no way to educate their children. And so the school has been established there now, and there's a, it's just a, a primary school right now. They hope to uh, advance it to a secondary school later on. But here's this school that's been established there, and in all of these schools, the teachers are teaching these Kikongo Bible studies. Hmm. And I asked them, I said, you mean even to like the very young children, the, for the elementary, the early elementary? He said, yes, they have to teach it more to children's model, but they all go through. Hmm. And so every grade is going through those Bible studies every single year. And so it's not just educating them for usefulness in this life, but it's educating them for uh, preparation for the next life as well. Amen. Amen. And as you see this work and the, the Bible workers, the schools, what are the primary needs that you see? Well, probably the greatest need is prayer for more workers. And then once there's more worker, once there are those that are able to work, there's need to support these workers. These workers are, uh, are sacrificing to, to labor. I mean, they're leaving their families, they're traveling long distances, and they could be doing other things that would be making more money. Mm -hmm. But as they want to give the message, they have a burden to give this message. And so right now, because of inflation and things like that, the, the Bible workers start out at getting like $10 a month or something mm -hmm. like that. But because of inflation, now it's about to 60, I think it's actually $61 a month. Mm -hmm. And it's still lower than what the teachers are getting uh, by far, but they're willing to work with that. But when there's 30-some Bible workers, that adds up. And uh, there's many more that are needed. And so support for these Bible workers to be able to give the message and that's one of the greatest needs. One, something else is tools for these Bible workers because when we, last time, we were able to get, I believe, 15 bicycles for the Bible workers, and that's about how many Bible workers there were then. Yeah. But now there's 40 or 50 that are ready to be Bible. I mean, there's already 35 that are Bible workers, and there's another 10 or 15 that want to become Bible workers and devote their lives full-time to giving the gospel. There are many more bicycles that are needed. And we experienced firsthand how helpful it is because Absolutely. when there were heavy things that they were carrying to the villages, it was a lot easier to put it on the back of a bicycle. And even if they weren't able to pedal through the sandy paths, they were able to push uh, that. Many of them sometimes, one place that we went, we didn't have a bicycle. We couldn't take a bicycle across on the dugout canoe. And so the, what they ended up doing was carrying on their head a box of Bibles. Now, 
this box got lighter because as we went to one village, we'd leave a few there, and then to another village, and we'd leave a few there. But still, can you imagine Heavy. carrying a box of Bibles? And Kikongo Bibles are, are they're large. They're very thick, <laughs> yes. I mean, one box is a very large, and it only, I mean, it only holds 16 Bibles or something like that, carrying these Bibles for 20 plus miles uh, on your head the whole time. Hmm. And a bicycle greatly helps for carrying Bible studies, carrying Bibles, carrying their little amount of personal effects that, that they might bring. And so bicycles, bicycles are about $125 or $130. They're not 10-speed or 21-speed bicycles or anything like that, but they're useful for what, uh, what they can do there. Makes, makes the work more efficient. Yes, absolutely. And what, what about the literature there? The literature is another big need. They're almost all out of Kikongo Bible studies again. Hmm. And uh, so they never want to be out of Kikongo Bible studies. Yeah. In fact, they said that whenever they give out the Kikongo Bible studies, people come up to them later and say, I need the Bible studies. And we, they say, well, we gave some to you already. They said, but it was when it's been taken and somebody else is now reading it. I don't have one for myself anymore. <laughs> and we've seen, I mean, the various pieces of literature that get handed out get handed from one person to person eventually just become rags, paper yes, rags. <laughs> yes. So they, they use it until there's no usefulness left in it, basically. And so reprinting of those Bible, those Kikongo Bible studies would be a tremendous help to them. Cost about a dollar twenty-five or something like that to reprint the one of the Bible studies. But there are thousands that are needed. Five to ten thousand more are needed and those would be at the rate they get out, those would be going out soon. Something else that I was very encouraged at, Brother Kasongo, who understands French and English, uh, has translated most of the book Great Controversy into Kikongo, into the local oh, language there. Which is, uh, he just has some of the last chapters to do still, he said, but is very important because even many of the Bible workers have a hard time understanding the French translation. First of all, there's not very many French translations of Desire of Ages or Great Controversy or these books. But even some of those, the French is so deep, he said, that it's difficult for them to understand it mm. some. So to get it in the Kikongo language would be such a help to them. And then, not just getting it into the language, but if we could print little uh, what, like pamphlets that are one chapter from it on, on selected chapters, and then print thousands and thousands, and then when they go into a village and when they share the message, say they present the law of God on the Sabbath or something, they could give them the chapter in Great Controversy right. dealing with yeah. that, and then they would be able to read it. Even if they didn't have a Bible then, the text would be there, and they would be able to have something that would, they would be able to sink their teeth into and that would really help to establish them. Amen. So Amen. that's a great need. And of course, Bibles are always a great need as well. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Bibles are $10 or more, and that's basically out of the means for those that are yeah. subsistence farmers that have virtually, they just grow what they eat. That's, there's, they deal very, very little with any money at all. Yeah. And so people are, find it very hard to even buy a Bible. Mm. And a few you see, when, you, when the whole village comes out, you might see if there's five or 600 people, you might see two or three Bibles that people have brought uh, that are their own. But help is needed so that they can be established in the truth through these Bibles as well. Man. I've been so encouraged also, you talked about how the Bible workers have sacrificed a month of their own salary to put yes. together a fund to help with building projects. Yes. But what are the other needs around building projects? Well, there's churches that are needed. They're, they're willing, what they would like to do is through their self-supporting buying and selling project that they all agreed upon doing, they would like to continue to build schools that way. and. Uh, they make very nice schools, as we saw when we were there. But, uh, and once again, I was so impressed that they were willing to sacrifice and to Amen. give to make the work go forward. Amen. But, you know, building a permanent church structure is very helpful for the church. First of all, it just gives permanency to the church. Hmm. They see that it's a permanent establishment there, and they're able to worship in it, whether it's raining or not. Because if they're just in the palm leaf structure church, you, you can, if it's raining hard, yeah. you cannot worship. Hard to get in people that, to come and yeah. come to church. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, you're going to get totally drenched, yeah. and uh, so that's not something that you want to want people to have to. I mean, they won't come if it's if it's raining like. And that. in many of these villages, 
these churches are the only church in the village. It's yes. not like there's other churches there. It's the only Christian church in the village. That's right. And so building more churches. There's four permanent churches that have been built there. There's one area, Kianji, that we were at, that the mission station was just beautiful. And I told Brother Kasong, I said, I'd like all of the mission station to be like this. The church that has the pillars that lets the uh, air and the sun in. And then they have a secondary and a primary school right there. And then they have gardens and the homes for the teachers. It was just really nicely arranged and everything. But helping to get that permanent church building there. It's with the cost of transportation and things, it's about four to five thousand dollars to build a permanent church there. And that's the church members doing a lot of the labor themselves and carrying a lot of the bags of cement on their head for miles mm. in order to bring it there. So they are putting themselves into having a church of their own as well. Mm. Well, what can uh, those who are watching, what can they do? The store is open. That's right. What can they do to help? The door is certainly open, and we don't know how long it will be open, mm -hmm. but the Lord has opened it now, and we need to go through the door that the Lord has opened. And, I mean, first of all, we can pray. That's Amen. the biggest thing we can do. Amen. They are praying for us every single day, and we can pray, and we need to pray for them. But, you know, there's more that we can do other than just praying. You know, there's we are there when the Bible workers are getting $60 a month, that's not very much for us. And we can sacrifice to help them in their work. You know, in Selected Messages it says, if God's people had the love of Christ in the heart, if every church member were thoroughly imbued with the spirit of self-denial, if all manifested thorough earnestness, there would be no lack of funds for home and foreign missions. Our resources would be multiplied. A thousand doors of usefulness would be opened, and we would be invited to enter. And that's exactly what is happening there. There are literally thousands of villages that want this message, that they are invited to enter. But they need the materials, they need the Bibles, they need the Bible studies. They need help to support the Bible workers so that they can support their family. You know, there's another statement in the book, Gospel Workers, and uh, this statement is just beautiful, showing what we can do. She says, why should not the members of a church or of several small churches unite to sustain a missionary in foreign fields? If they will deny themselves, they can do this. My brethren and sisters, will you not help in this great work? I beseech you to do something for Christ and do it now. Hmm. Through the teacher whom your money shall sustain in a foreign field, souls may be saved to shine as stars in the Redeemer's crown. Amen. However small your offering, do not hesitate to bring it to the Lord. If given from a heart filled with love to the Savior, the smallest offering becomes a priceless gift hmm. which God smiles upon. And bless us. And so there's a work that we can all do. We can all pray. We can all pray for our brethren there that are striving under difficulties that we can just hardly imagine yeah. what it's like. And then we can pray and see how the Lord would have us to give of our funds, to give of our means to help our brethren there. They are carrying building materials for churches. They're sacrificing an entire month's wages to help the work go forward. God's message must go forward in this area of Congo. The Bible says that the gospel, the three angels' message, is to go to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That includes the province of Bandundu. <laughs> that includes the tribes and the languages that are there. And the Lord has workers, Brother Kasongo and the team of Bible workers that are there, ready to do the work. And they need our help so that we can help them to do the work, to print the Bible studies, to buy the Bibles, to build the churches. And I'm so excited as I see the work going forward there. And I would like to ask you to pray and see how the Lord would have you to be involved in this work, to ask Him what you can do, what you can get to help the work go forward there. Because as the work goes forward there, it helps the work go forward here at home and around the world. And as the work goes forward there and here and everywhere, 
very soon we can be together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot imagine the joy of being together with the workers there, with the brethren here, and joining together in that heavenly land. But Amen. we have a part to play. May the Lord help us to walk through this open door. If you have questions or would like to support this project, you may write us at Mission Projects International, P.O. Box 59656, Renton, Washington, 98058, or call us at 1-800-467-4174, or email us at info at missionspro.org. You can learn more about some of the other mission projects that we are involved in by visiting us on the web at www.missionspro.org. Let us work together to take the everlasting gospel to every nation and kindred and tongue and people.